Am I the only one that enjoys coming to church? I mean, seriously, this is like the highlight of my week. Just to see y'all and to watch you engage one another and smiling and laughing and worshiping and it's just a good thing that we do together. I don't know why anybody would skip out on a Sunday morning at church. I mean, seriously, I think sometimes people skip out on church because the church they were raised in was no fun. It was boring. There was no life in it. It was dead. It was filled with people who hushed children for making too much noise in worship. It was for folks who, would, when they'd walk in, they felt like everybody was judging them because they didn't have themselves together. Themselves together. They showed up late and everybody made, gave those eyes at them when they showed up. Hey, at least they came, Right? Man, I love this church because it feels like the kind of place, and until somebody fires me, it feels like the kind of place <laughs> that I can really just be myself, and, and I want that to be what you experience when you're here, that you can show up and just be yourself, and that despite the things you put on social media, you don't have it all together, and it's okay. It's okay, because here, I don't have it all together. That's pretty obvious, but you're surrounded by people whose lives are a mess, I mean, some of them might be going through a really good time right now, and their lives are a little cleaner today than they used to be, but, but you live long enough, and you end up in a puddle. One you step and fall in, or one that someone drives through and splashes you with, but somehow we all end up dirty in this game, this game of life, and some of us pretend that we never got dirty, we never got anybody else dirty. This isn't that kind of church. This is the church where we all showed up and said, we've been dirty, but thanks be to God, but thanks be to God that there was one who was not. And no matter how dirty we got, he was willing to clean us up. He cleans us up. We don't have to clean up our own act. He cleans it up for us. And somehow by just welcoming his friendship, welcoming his salvation, somehow just welcoming him into our lives, we get to walk this righteous thing out because of what we've done and because of what he's done for us. And that's really kind of where this week is headed. But I want to tell you, I had a, a, a conversation with a neighbor uh, just yesterday. This is a neighbor who I, I've known um, since we moved in shortly thereafter. And, and we interact quite a bit. Uh, this is a, one of my neighbors who, I think if you uh, were to ask this neighbor, they would say they are a believer. But they're definitely not interested in the church, at least not anymore. And so uh, yesterday I was out watering my grass because I laid some new sod down in my yard and, and trying to keep it soggy so it'll grow. And, and this neighbor and I started to engage one another, and, and the conversation started with, with uh, the question, hey, pastor, it's going to be a busy week for you this week, isn't it? So yeah, there's a lot extra this week. Well, it's going to be a good one, won't it? I said, yeah, I'm expecting it to be a good Sunday. No, no better than tomorrow, though. Hey, by the way, are you going to join us? This year, it's an invitation I make every year. You gonna be there this year? We'd love to love to have you. If you can't come, don't worry because if the weather's right, we're gonna be outside and you'll be able to hear me from your house. <laughs> It'll echo all the way across this side of the road. That's what I love about worshiping outside: hearing the echo of good news landing in the ears of folks who were trying to avoid it, or who otherwise didn't hear the news of Jesus as being good news. And the longer he and I talked yesterday, uh, one of the things I found out and realized is that um, the news of Jesus has not been good news. The news of the church has not been good news. Uh, experience of, of God and experience of God's church has not been great for this neighbor of mine. Uh, this neighbor of mine, um, I said, are you going to join us? And said, no, I'm not sure what I believe anymore. And I got to admit, there was a lot of courage to do that because this neighbor was on the sidewalk and I was up in my front yard. We're literally talking fairly loud across the street, but was willing to say, I, I just don't know. I just don't know. Said my, my sister, I mean, my wife lost three sisters in a very short period of time. Why would God bring those sisters to her and, and take them so quickly? My dad, I moved, moved my dad and we, his health is horrible and he always believed, but why were the things happening? It was, just, it was a, a classic example of there's good things and bad things going on in the world, and when the bad things happen, where's God when the bad things happen? All of us have asked that question. 
And I did my best to try to reassure across the street from a distance, hey, you know, God's good. And I can tell you more about good, the good of God. Oh, oh, pastor, don't, don't worry about it. We're, we will, um, we will celebrate each. We have a nice little meal. And so, but there's so much more, brother. I want you to, I want you to experience more. He went his way, I went mine. And I just wanted to, I wanted to stop short because I didn't want to be pushy. But I just realized that this, this faith that I found to be so good, this news that I found to be such good news, continues to land flat on folks sometimes. And I'm trying to pray for new words and new methods, new ways to, to just reveal good news uh, to the people around me. Here's some, something that I picked up in my conversation with him and something that I found to be true. Maybe you found this to be true. Our faith is hard. It's not easy to be a Christian. It's even harder to follow Jesus, but... And they are two different things sometimes. In this cultural Christianity in which we live, it's a little easier to say I believe and to claim my eternal security because I said a prayer somewhere back then. And, but the living of the faith, the following Jesus, it's hard because it's hard to believe. It's hard to believe. This, what God has done in the person of Jesus, the way that people believed in this Jesus, the things that Jesus did are so unbelievable. It's hard to get your mind around. That can make it hard. It's confusing. This faith of ours sometimes is hard to know and to feel. Much like my neighbor, it was easier to know and to feel when things were good, when family members were alive. But when they're gone and when life turns the direction we didn't want it to go, it's really hard to keep following when our heart gets broken. It's hard. I find that in, in our culture, one of the things that I've seen Christianity sort of boil down to is a list of doing right and not doing wrong. I'm a Christian if I do the right thing and don't do that thing. I'm a Christian if I vote this way or don't vote that way. I'm a Christian if I don't drink in public or drink too much in public. Somehow Christianity has been boiled down to some sort of moralistic code. And for those who have allowed Christianity to be just a moralistic code of doing enough right things to balance out the ledger sheet of all the things we've done wrong, we completely miss the boat, and we realize it's a, it's a battle. It's hard. It's hard to do the right thing all the time. If any of you in the room have figured out how to do it, please come tell your pastor, because I've not figured this thing out yet. Just this past week, what started as a, a real simple opportunity to cheer for my son at a baseball game turned into me heckling a teenage boy. <laughs> I heckled a teenage boy. I heckled an official. Asked him if it was past his bedtime. <laughs> I mean, I made fun of the young and the old all in the same game, and I had to apologize both to my son for embarrassing him and to our youth pastor and volunteers who came to support my son. I'm not proud of it. I'm actually very ashamed of it. In the moment, I thought I was doing right, and it didn't take long for the look from my wife or the feeling of shame <laughs> deep within me to take over. It's hard to do right all the time. And some of you go, well, that's the worst thing you've done. I cheated on my wife this week. I stole from my company this week. I'm an unethical businessman. And but here's the thing. No matter, no matter what it is that you have done, you want to do the right thing and you, you can't. We'll get to that Romans 7 in a number of weeks from now when we get into Romans but the Christian faith is hard, too, because all the things we want to do, the biblical things, we want to do these things. We want to love God with everything we got. We want to love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. We wake up, we get out of bed with all these great intentions, and then by the time we lay our bed, head back on the bed, that night we've realized how far short we've fallen. It's hard. We can't help ourselves, and that's the whole point. That's the whole point of getting to the end of ourselves and realizing there's only one who can make us righteous. There's only one who did it right every single time. And we can lean in on him. We can trust him. Now, this week for me, this Sunday morning in particular, this moment is 
filled with a little bit of tension because in a normal year of church, in our church, on this Sunday, we would just talk about Palm Sunday. We would just talk about like waving palm branches. Here they are. We just saw the kids waving them. We just talk about palm branches. We talk about how the, the people had become convinced that Jesus was the only one who could save them. Jesus was the only one who could redeem them, and they would wave these palm branches the way that they would do for the, the Feast of the Tabernacles. It was supposed to be the, the, the palm branch was sort of a sign of oneness and unity and of victory. And on Palm Sunday, that's what they were doing. The problem is we've been going through the Gospel of John, and we already covered this material, and it was back in John chapter 12. Let me remind you what happened in John chapter 12, because it is Palm Sunday, and you want to be reminded of that. A crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, and they took palm branches, and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, which literally means, Lord, save us. You are king. Save us. Redeem us. Rescue us from this horrible government. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey, and he sat on it as it's written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And at first, his disciples didn't understand all of this, and only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb, remember he raised Lazarus from the dead back there, I think in chapter 11, they continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed that sign, they went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look at how the whole world's going after him. You got the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, coming face to face with a whole bunch of folks who are starting to believe. In fact, belief in Jesus was getting so great that the Pharisees are scared to death. It's got the believers waving palm branches. You are the king. Who is Caesar anyway? You'll be the one. You'll be the one. They're all getting riled up. The ruckus crowd and the religious leaders, oh, they're stewing. And so what we, what we walked through the past number of weeks is we have from basically chapters 13 through 17, we have Jesus eating, teaching, praying. He washes some feet. He has his feet washed by some expensive perfume. And during all of this time, which is really just a day or so, during all this time, the religious leaders are putting their little scheme together, putting their plan together. How are we going to get rid of this King Jesus? Plans were being made to cancel him. You remember last week, we find him in the garden with his believers, and, and they, the soldiers come, and religious leaders come, and Judas come, and they arrest him, and Peter cuts off the ear, and Jesus heals it, and they arrest him. He's arrested. Peter denies him, and he goes on trial. And that catches us up to where we are right now. In chapter 19, let me read the first five verses to you. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. We get him arrested. Just a little bit ago, they were waving the palm branch. The people waving the palm branch. And in verse 1, chapter 19, comes this. Now, there's a lot of gruesome details that we could go into about chapter 19, and I'm not going to do it because we're a PG audience in the room and watching online. But when this was handed to me, I wasn't sure how to take it. I just wasn't sure what to do with it. At first, I didn't want to touch it. 
Now, it's just a replica. We didn't dig this thing up. Everything used here would have disintegrated by now except for the bones and the stones and the metal that would have been in here. But we see this really interesting thing happen, this turn. Palm branches, hail, king of the Jews, rescue us. To Pilate, wanting to release him. Remember last chapter saying you can have Jesus for free. You can have him back or you can have Barabbas, who we know has already created an uprising and maybe even committed a murder. And the people. Maybe the same people holding palm branches, maybe a different group of people than the ones holding the palm branches, but the people nonetheless watched as Pilate handed him over to a flogging. I mean, most of us, if you've ever seen The Passion of the Christ all the way through, maybe you get this. I can't watch the thing. It's overwhelming to me, and if you've seen it, I don't have to tell you. And if you're thinking it would be a great Easter film for your family, I would resist. Because what we see Jesus doing is something nobody wants to see Jesus doing. We don't want to see human suffering, not at this level. We don't want to see human hate, not at this level. And we definitely don't want to be accomplices, much less the reason. For two men to stand on either side of Jesus who was strapped to a pole and to take turns with two hands swinging this. We don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want to watch it. I wish it never happened. And at the very same time, I'm so grateful that it did. We go from Jesus being all hell, King Jesus. Jesus, the bread of life, the nourishment of our souls. To Jesus, the criminal. It creates an interesting tension, doesn't it? It's like we want the goodness of God. We want the the little child Bible treasures story. No pain, no tragedy. I mean, I'm just going to tell you what I long for more than anything is a church and a community and a people of God who live out their days not doing this, but doing what a few hundred men were doing just a few weekends ago. I don't know if you can hear that, if we have the volume or not. Play that one more time, Keaton. Listen to the voices. I mean, that's Palm Sunday. That's Palm Sunday, 300 plus grown men who may or may not ever lift their hands in worship in their local church, but who when they gather together and were just overwhelmed by the enormity of King Jesus, the blessedness of King Jesus, the, the willingness of King Jesus to go through what King Jesus went through to be king of heaven and earth, we could not stop short of. All hell. All hell. In chapter 19 that we go through, we have this back and forth. If you read it for yourself, you'll see this back and forth. Pilate wants to set him free. The people say, he's not our king. Pilate, he is your king. The people, he's not our king. Caesar is our king. Wait a second. A few days ago, you were waving palm branches because Caesar's not your king. He's your king. Make up your mind. What do you want? Do you want him to be your king or not? 
They go, we don't want him. And despite Pilate's own wife saying, hey, leave that innocent man alone because I've been having dreams. We read about that in Matthew. Pilate says, okay, he's yours. You can have him. You can crucify him. If you don't want him to be your king, you don't have to let him be your king. But here's what I'm writing on the sign above his crucifixion cross. King of the Jews. And I'm going to write it in three languages so everybody who comes by here sees it. They can see for me. Clearly, this is the king. To which the people respond, no, 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 just, just write on there somewhere that he claimed to be the king. I can almost see Pilate going, what do you, what do you mean he claimed to be the king? Y'all were claiming him to be the king in the streets. That's what got us all into this. So I found myself going back to, to verse five. He says, Pilate brings him out wearing the crown of thorns, the purple robe, after he'd gone through all this, and simply says to them, here is the man. Here is the man. A Jewish man who claimed to be God. The young Jewish carpenter who learned some magicianship to accomplish the things he did, who was completely out of his mind to say the things that he said. Or he is God. Standing before the people. For you, for me, he, he's either the, the young Jewish boy turned carpenter who ends up for about three years wandering the, the countryside, performing things that we hadn't seen quite performed this way and saying things we hadn't quite heard that way before. Who, when he had the chance to, to admit it was all a farce, that's the only reason the Romans did the flogging thing in the, in the first place. The whole thing was to get you to tell the truth. They figured after a couple swats with this thing, you would put all your lies behind you. That's the only reason they did this and he refused to change his story or change his tune. So I put him before you. Here is the man. Here is the man. Who, who, who is this Jesus for you? I've been looking at him all week. I even keep a crucifix in my office to remember. Next Sunday, we're going to come back and celebrate in our best clothes that he's risen from the grave. And I assure you, if you walk through the next six days between now and then, living into the reality of what has just occurred, and if you ask yourself, you confront yourself with the question, here is the man who is this man Jesus for me, you'll be back next Sunday celebrating in a way you've never celebrated before.